All right. If you remember, last day we started on quantum error correction. And I said that the plan was first just to figure out how it is that quantum, or quantum error correction is even possible. You know, what is it and, and how is it even possible? Um, then we'll discuss a little bit why it is that quantum error correction occurs quite naturally in many body quantum systems. And then I'll move on to the formalism of stabilizer codes and uh, hopefully we'll get to the example of the toric code. Um, so that's the plan. And we got partway through, or we got through the first quantum error correcting code. And I'll refresh your memories on what was going on there. It was a very unambitious quantum error correcting code. The bit flip code. And all we were, all we, wanted to do in this case was correct against the possibility of the first bit, the second bit, or the third bit being flipped. So the Pauli operators uh, acting on the first qubit, the second qubit, or the third qubit could act. And we, wouldn't, we don't know in advance which one it is. And the way we did that is just uh, we mapped the zero state to zero, 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 the one state to one, 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 uh, and then all other states in uh, the zero, one subspace are just, uh, you know, the action of the map is defined or is uh, um, defined by linearity. And what we found is that if we measured the parity of the first and the second bit and the parity of the second and third bit, which we could do with these observables, Z1, Z2, and Z2, Z3, um, that that was enough to determine whether or not one of these bit flips had happened and where it happened. Uh, and if, if we know whether it, you know, if, we, if we know that it didn't happen, then we do nothing. And if we know where it happened, then we apply the appropriate x1, x2, x3, so the appropriate bit, bit flip to fi fix the problem. And that's all there was to it. So this is just the the quantum mechanical. It, it's almost just writing the um, it's writing the the repetition code that we talked about classically in quantum mechanical notation, and observing that you don't exactly have to do majority vote. Um, to correct in the case of the repetition code, uh, you, can, uh, you can look at these parodies to identify the location of the error. Um, and the advantage of that is that you don't actually learn what the, what the message was. And that's crucial in order to make sure that we don't collapse the superposition uh, in the code space. Okay. But that doesn't really accomplish very much because it's, you know, you're very lucky if your quantum system only uh, experiences the errors x1, x2, x3. Um, so let's think now about phase flip errors. So we could have the identity, Z acting on the first qubit, Z acting on the second qubit, or Z acting on the third qubit, like so. Um, now, a first question would just be, maybe, you know, maybe we're lucky. Maybe that bit flip code that we wrote down can correct against these errors already. So let's just check. Let's think about, for example, Z1 acting on one of these code states for the bit flip code a superposition of 0, 0, 0, and 1, 1, 1. What will it do? It will map it to alpha 0, 0, 0, because uh, Pauli Z does nothing if the input is 0, but it flips the phase if the input was 1. OK? Now, this is still a superposition of 0, 0, 0, and 1, 1, 1. And so this is in, I called it script C, was the, the bit flip code up above. So it's still in the bit flip code subspace, uh, when we measure the you know, when we measure the parities, the parities all all check out, and so um, the bit flip code will not detect any errors having occurred. So the bit flip code is not going to correct against these these errors. Um, so the bit flip code cannot detect phase error. So we have to do something else. Um, but what we do is uh, yeah, <laughs> it's it's not very difficult. Um, I'm just going to write down a little unit two by two unitary matrix. Well, the Hadamard matrix, one, 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 minus one. Um, and this is the matrix that takes the Pauli X to Pauli Z and the Pauli Z to Pauli X, right? Because remember, these are uh, X and Z are, are both um, two by two matrices whose eigenvalues are one and minus one. So they're related by uh, some change of basis. And the change of basis is this, uh, this Hadamard. Um, so the eigenstates of, this, of the Pauli X operator, we've seen them before. They're the superpositions with opposite signs of zero, the zero and the one states. And if we ask what does 
what does Z do to these eigenstates? Well, it flips the phase. And so it maps plus minus to minus and plus, right? And so this phase flip error, Z, is actually a bit flip error. So is a bit flip, as long as you work in a different basis, right? So we're used to diagonalizing. You know, you're given some matrix, and it's not diagonal. And then you write it in the diagonal make it, uh, basis to make it simpler. Here, the Zs are given to us diagonal, and we write them in a basis in which they're not diagonal because we want to turn them into bit flips, right? So we sort of do the opposite of what you're used to doing in linear algebra. Um, and because the, the phase flip errors in this plus minus basis are just bit flips, um, we can just use the, uh, the basis in which phase errors are bit flips to define the code. So we just map alpha 0 plus beta 1 to alpha plus 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 beta minus minus minus, right? So it's still a repetition code. And it's actually, it's, it's a bit flip code, but in a different basis. Um, and here, I'm just going to fill in that table, this, the analog of the table we did last day. What observables are we going to measure? And what actions are we going to take? So let's go back to the table uh, for the bit flip code. It's going to be exactly the same thing, but x's and z's are switched. Right, and so the observables we'll measure will be x1 and x2, uh, and z1 or uh, x2, x3, and then the actions we, we take will be to apply the appropriate phases. So our observables are now x1, x2, x2, x3, and that me measures the parities of the pluses and minuses. And if they both check out, we do nothing. Uh, if there is a phase flip in the first qubit, we apply phase flip in the first qubit, and likewise phase flip in the second, phase flip in the third. And so that's the, the that's how you protect against phase flips. They're just bit flips in a different basis. Okay. A any questions about that? Okay. That was still um, maybe not terribly impressive, but now let's try to do both at the same time. And that starts to become more interesting, right? Because bit and phase, or bit flips and phase flips don't commute. Um, and this is the, the first quantum error correcting code that was ever discovered. And it's called the shore code. And I'll see, you know, I'll, I'll see if you can figure out what it is that you should do. So suppose that um, it's a very cold and rainy day. And you have a, a jacket that protects you against the rain, but it's very thin. And you also have a nice warm down jacket that's not waterproof. So what do you do? You wear them both. You wear them both, right? And so this is what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to wear both these codes. We will compose them. Uh, so we're going to compose the bit and phase flip codes. And so we're going to have an input state phi. It's going to be mapped. You know, time is going from left to right into some logical uh, logical phi. And I just need to come up with some labels for the encodings. And so let's just go back. So here's the phase flip code. And I'm going to call the encoding for the phase flip code E sub P, so E, e, e phase. I was chuckling before the class because I was just looking at my notes. And I realized that in my notes, I call it E sub F. So I was. I was, I was uh, I was writing phase with an F instead of a P. Um, and then for the bit flip code, let's call the encoding there E sub B. OK? So um, we're going to do one and then the other. And it's convenient just to, to do the phase flip code first. So EP, and then the bit ask, flip code afterwards. There was a question? Yes, uh, sorry to interrupt, but I was sure. just wondering, you know, when you were discussing the phase flip code, what if I don't, uh, if, uh, what if I introduce a, a random phase, you know, not plus minus one, but. Oh, ex excellent question. And that will be the next slide. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I'll just finish filling these in. Like so. And let's just think about what the code words look like. So if we have zero coming in, um, the phase flip code maps the zero to plus, plus, plus. And it maps the one to minus, minus, minus. And, I'll, and then the bit flip codes 
what does that do? It repeats the bits inside each of those minuses, right? So the first minus becomes 0, 0, 0, minus 1, 1, 1, because it was 0, minus 1, and now we repeat the bits. The second one becomes 0, 0, 0, minus 1, 1, 1. The third one becomes 0, 0, 0, minus 1, 1, 1. And the reason I did the minuses first is so I can just copy them. The plus, this, uh, the pluses are the same, but the phases are plus. Oops. Plus, plus, plus. So that's what the code words lo look like. Um, it's a little bit, little bit cumbersome, uh, and as you'll see, we don't usually work with error correcting codes explicitly in terms of the wave functions for that reason. Um, but let's think about what we, what we're going to need to measure to correct this code. Uh, and at the outer level, you know, you're clo you know, closest to the actual physical qubits, we're just encoding into bit flip codes, right? And so we're going to have to correct each of those bit flip codes. Uh, and you can see that in the code words um, that we have these repeated sets, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, uh, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. And so we can just uh, correct those bit flip codes uh, independently. And then for notation, I'll just number the qubits. Oops. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Um, so the observables you know, for the first bit, bit flip code are Z1, Z2, Z2, Z3. Right? We just read them off the table from the original bit flip code. Uh, for the second bit flip code, it's the same thing, but we start at, we start at 4. So Z4, Z5, Z5, Z6. And then for the last one, it starts at 7. So Z7, Z8, Z8, Z9. And this is going to, if you, if you measure the parities, you'll learn if there was a bit flip and you apply the appropriate xj to correct. So that covers the bit flips. The phase flips are a little bit fancier in that we can go back to our table. You know, we were supposed to measure, say, x1, x2, and x2, x3. But that's with respect to uh, these qubits right here. So we have to commute those observables past the, the bit flip encoding. Um, and that's an exercise you can do. I won't do it here. But if you commute them past, x1, x2 becomes x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, x6. So x is on the first, uh, the first two thirds of the qubits. And um, x2, x3, uh, x2, x3 becomes x4, x5, x6, x7, x8, x, x9, like that. Um, and of course, then you apply the appropriate phase correction uh, when you're done. And just some vocabulary that you might hear uh, later from Michael Walter or others. Given, what, given an error correcting code, um, you know, you're going to measure these, or at least uh, this kind of code, you're going to measure these observables. And the observables are going to tell you roughly, you know, essentially what went wrong. And so you call that the syndrome. And so this is a syndrome measurement, right? Just like you, know, you go to the doctor and the you know, they catalog your symptoms, and that's called your syndrome. Um, OK, a, a, little, a little observation here. Um, with respect to the bit flips, we had six observables, and those were enough to localize the bit flip errors for us. Um, but for the phase flips, we only have two observables. And so clearly, there are only four possible outcomes, and we can't figure out exactly where the phase flip happened. right? And we can just see that in the code that if we apply a phase flip to one of these logical states, it won't matter whether we flip, flip the phase on the first bit, the second bit, or the third bit. Right? The it will be the same thing that happens. It will just map you from the top to the bottom or the top bottom to the top. So that's the same as Z2 acting on phi logical, and that's the same as Z3 acting on phi logical. So you won't. With error, quantum error correcting codes, you don't actually necessarily find out exactly what happened. But what you will find out is exactly what you need to know in order to correct the error. Because as long as you know that the error in this case, they happened in the first block, um, you can apply a Z anywhere in the first block uh, to correct the error. Um, and so this code corrects any single, let's see, it can correct a bit flip or a phase flip. 
Um, and because you correct these uh, these these types of errors using independent error mechan or correction mechanisms, you can also correct their products. So that's really the the y errors. Okay. Uh, and so you can correct X er you know, a single X error, a single Y error, or a single Z error uh, on any qubit. You don't have to know where that qubit, uh, where the error occurred. So this is now starting to be less trivial, right? We're actually accomplishing something that uh, you might have thought was, uh, was difficult. But it does more than, than that. So this was the question that came up. What about other kinds of errors um, that could occur? So let's just think, you know, what kinds of errors could occur on a single qubit, well, you could just have, you know, an arbitrary SU two transformation acting on a single qubit, right? Uh, not necessarily one of these bit flips or phase flips or uh, Pauli y, uh, but just you know, rotation by one one millionth of a degree or something. Or uh, we've talked about quantum channels. You could have some quantum channel acting again on a single qubit, right? And my claim is that this code is going to correct any of those as well. Those will come, those will come along for free. Um, and so the, the SU2 is a special case of a channel. So we'll just think of a channel. And so let's imagine that there's a channel acting um, and it's acting on a particular qubit, say the kth qubit. And one of those Kreis operators looks like this. And so it's going to be sufficient to correct for an arbitrary matrix acting in the kth position. And I'm going to ignore normalization uh, all through this. You know, the normalization is going to work out just fine at the end. So, um, OK, so what are we going to do? I'm going to write uh, NJ, NJ, which is just this arbitrary matrix. It's a two by two matrix in this case, right? So I can expand it as say gamma zero times the identity, gamma one times x, gamma two times z, gamma three times x times z for some coefficients that are just complex numbers, right? Um, because these four matrices span uh, the two by two matrices, the identity x, z, and, and y basically. And so, Phi logical, um, if I act by nj in the kth position, what's going to happen? It's going to go to gamma 0 times the identity, gamma 1, an x acting in the kth position, gamma 2, a z acting in the kth position. Oh, actually, I better space these out better. Sorry. So they align properly. So this is now going to be gamma 1 xk, gamma 2, zk, gamma 3, xk, zk, is there... acting on the logical state, right? Yeah. So this is what's going to happen. Um, we're going to have this matrix, um, which acts trivially on all sites except for the kth site, and the subscripts k indicate where those Pauli operators are acting. Um, and what we've seen by our previous analysis of the error correction, um, each of these four possibilities requires a different response, right, by uh, in the error correction. And, and so our error correcting code, when we, when we measure our syndrome, is going to, um, well, each of those, each of the branches of this wave function um, for these four different possibilities are going to be orthogonal in the error correcting code. Casey, you had a question? Uh, yeah, can you can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, my question was: Is there any um, um, advantage to using um, this Z and X uh, XZ or XZ notation instead of doing like X Y and Z? Is there a um, reason why you're doing that? Or well, the reason is just we don't need to treat Y as independent. Say, yeah, uh, uh, we, we don't have to. Y comes along for free. Okay. And and that's why. Um, I, I'm just keeping the X's and Z's around, just you know, okay. so that we, just that you remember. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. But I have nothing against Y. Okay. So the, these four branches of the wave function are orthogonal to each other, and what that means is that when you actually measure the syndrome, 
you're going to collapse the superposition over these different types of errors into um, specific bit and phase and combinations of bits, bit and phase errors, right? And so the the error, you know, the actual error that the that the system experienced was continuous. But when you measure your syndrome, you actually discretize it and turn it into one of a finite number of possibilities that you know how to handle, right? And so that's a that's a wonderful thing about quantum mechanics, right? Uh, yeah, the, the errors are continuous, but you can make them discrete, right? You can discretize them. Um, and so that's it. So the short code will connect, will correct uh, any error uh, on an arbitrary, or rather, on a single unknown qubit. So you don't need to know where the error occurred. Um, as long as there's only one of them, uh, it can be anything that is uh, that is permissible by quantum mechanics, and you can correct it. And so all those uh, all those objections that were made to the possibility of being able to perform quantum error correction, um, you know, the fact that there was no cloning, the fact that the errors were continuous and the state was continuous, the fact that measurement causes disturbance. None of these things is actually a problem, right? We're actually making use of the fact that measurement causes disturbance to discretize the errors. It's actually a good thing. Um, and so quantum error correction works. Are there any other questions about that before we move on? Casey, your hand is up, but I think it's just a legacy hand. It is, sorry about yeah, that, okay. I'll take it away. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Okay, if not, I'd like to discuss why it is that um, quantum error correction um, comes up uh, and is a, a phenomenon that naturally occurs in many quantum many body systems. And this somehow has you know, this got the name the, the decoupling argument, which may not be the best uh, thing. I was going to call it something else, but I figured if you wanted to Google search, you should probably know what it's uh, what people often refer to it as. And so I'm just going to take you through the story, uh, and it, it's uh, it, it's a well, it's an interesting and subtle argument. It's, it's a short argument, but it's a subtle one. Okay. So here I'm just going to, you know, for the sake of argument, I'm going to imagine maybe that we have some material. It's in a plane. Maybe a, the um, maybe it's a spin system, and there's spins located at each of the, the vertices of the square lattice. Um, and I'm going to prepare some initial state of this blue qubit, or a qubit. I'll call it a qubit just for good measure, just out of habit, but it doesn't have to be a qubit. So we'll call this thing, I'll zoom in here, phi, and we'll call that our system that we're interested in. And then the rest of the material, let's say that it's in some state chi. And now it's, you know, the system's gonna evolve unitarily um, and very, you know, intuitively, you know, roughly speaking, what's going to happen is that the, you know, the state phi, which we imagine as our quantum information, uh, is going to get spread out um, through the material, right? Um, and so this phi s chi m is going to go to some unitary as a function of time phi s chi m. And the information about phi is going to spread out. And assuming nearest neighbor couplings, uh, you know, you, what you would expect is that you know, at some early time, it might spread out into this region and then spread out wider and spread out wider like that. Right? You know, this is just kind of intuitively speaking what we might expect to happen. But we could ask the precise question, where is the quantum information about phi? Right? I, could, I could choose to write down some, you know, some region here. I'll highlight it. We'll even, get, even give it a name. I'll call this A. And we could ask, is the quantum information about phi located at A in some future time? And that language is, you know, it's vague language. But in an earlier lecture, we discussed what it means for quantum information uh, to be transmitted from, you know, uh, transmitted somewhere. Um, and the way that we, we saw that a good way to talk about that was to introduce a reference system that was entangled with a system of interest and to see whether the entanglement with the reference system uh, 
can be recovered from the uh, you know in the in the situation you're interested in. So we'll introduce a reference system. So reference system R that's entangled with S at time t equals zero. And then the question is really going to be where does the entanglement with the reference, how does the entanglement with the reference um, propagate through this, uh, this material? And can you recover it when you look at a subsystem? So we're going to abstract this away. We're not going to talk about the individual sites and the nearest neighbor, neighbor coupling or anything like that anymore. And so I'm going to draw this in our, you know, our usual picture where we have um, quantum systems propagating from left to right. Um, and maybe some unitary transformations or channels or other things uh, in, in blocks. And so I have my system and the rest of the material. The rest of the material started off in the state chi. And we introduced a reference system R. And we'll say that the system is originally entangled with the reference. And then they jointly undergo this time evolution, U of t. And let's say that after u of t, we have to give the state a name, so we'll call it rho. And it's a pure state. Uh, and I guess we introduced this system A, and that we wanted to ask the question, is the entanglement with reference present in A? And let's just call everything else A bar. Are there questions about the setup there? OK. Well, if not, Let's just um, suppose for the sake of argument that if we look at the density operator of the reference and A bar, right? So A bar is the part that we're not interested in, the part that's not highlighted in yellow here. And I intentionally, and maybe I'll even make, you know, I'll even make A bar smaller. And so- uh, I have a question. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so the, the lines between the boxes, are those supposed to be thought of as being like at the same time? Or is this- uh, Yeah, so the- um, Constant time is the vertical direction. Yeah, so, so time, just like that. Okay, so I'm gonna look at the density operator of R and A bar. And now let's imagine that this evolution is chaotic, is mixing, thermalizing, you know, um, what you expect if A bar is a small fraction um, of the total system. And here I've intentionally also draw it, drawn it mostly outside these, uh, you know, these green concentric lines. And so um, if it's sufficiently small, we might expect it to, to not actually contain any information um, about that reference, right? To not contain any entanglement. Um, and typically that's what's going to happen if you look at sufficiently small subsystems um, of uh, some chaotic system for the propagation of entanglement. And what does it mean? If it doesn't contain any information, or uh, what I mean by that is just saying that the state factorizes, right? So this is the you remember the condition. Well, it's the state. That there, it's the statement. There are no correlations between the reference and a bar, right? So at early times, that's certainly going to you know, we would expect that to be true because the information is all going to be concentrated near the center of this uh, uh, of this plane. Uh, at late times, as long as we take a, 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 you know, a bar sufficiently small, we'd, we'd also expect this to be true. Um, and so this is a situation, or at least approximately true. So this is a situation that we expect to, you know, to occur quite naturally in many situations in, in many body strongly interacting systems. Okay. Well, now we're going to just think structurally about this state a little bit. So we can construct a purification. And we're going to purify row A bar, uh, row R A bar. So row R A bar. And I'm going to purify it to some larger system. All right, so remember, we, we talked about purifications of quantum states early on. This, these are just quantum states that are pure states. When we trace over the, um, the extra systems, we get, we get back the original density operator we we're talking about. So 
The way that I'm going to do it is I'm going to purify it to another copy of S in some system B. OK? So why am I doing that? Well, the reason I'm doing that is that I, could, I already know how to, um, well, sorry, I'm going to give myself a little bit more room here. So this quantum state is a product state. And so I can purify them individually, right? So first I'll purify row R, and then I'll purify row A, a bar. And if I want a purification of the reference system state, well, it means I'm pure, I want a purification of the reduced density operator on R. I never touched the reference, and I have such a state already, phi, right? That's a purification of the reference. So I'll use that. So I'll say my purification is going to be phi reference s, just the same as the initial state we started with. Um, and then I also have to purify the state on a bar. I don't know what I'm going to purify it as. It doesn't really matter. It won't matter for the sake of this argument. So I'll just say I'll purify that to some system b. OK, so this is, you know, I've just written down some purification, which is a valid purification of the state. And I'm going to introduce some labels here. This is going to be S, and this is going to be B at the end of the day. But we'll, you know, we're not there yet. So all I've done is I've said mathematically, this, you know, this new state that I've written down, and I'll highlight it, um, that is a purification of the state on R and A bar. You know, that's all I'm saying. But then we go back and remember the Schmidt decomposition. Right? What did the Schmidt decomposition tell, tell us? It told us that if we had a bipartite pure quantum state, um, all states with the same Schmidt coefficients were unitarily related to each other with, with local unitaries acting on both factors. Right? And if the Hilbert space dimensions weren't the same, then these weren't necessarily unitaries, um, but they were inner product preserving maps. You know, so they're sort of morally unitaries. Um, so let's apply that in this situation because we're going to have two different purifications of, of rho r a bar. So in the first case, um, what do we have? Well, let's see. What's my first, what's my first purification of a a bar? Well, it's the actual state in the quantum system that we're talking about, the state rho, right? So rho was actually defined as a state that was globally pure. So we can talk about rho. And we're going to relate it to the new purification that I wrote down to uh, SB. And that was phi psi. OK. And you know, the argument from the Schmidt decomposition just tells us that by acting locally on the A system or, and the SV system, we should be able to turn one of these states into the other. Right? That's what, you know, that's just a, yeah, that is a, a corollary of the Schmidt decomposition. Well, let's try to turn the two states into each other. Basically, what that means is we have to make sure that the, uh, the reduced density operators are diagonal in the same bases. Well, on R, who on R and A bar, that should be a bar there, uh, the reduced density operators are the same by definition because we constructed these as purifications of the same state. So we don't have to do anything on R and A bar. Uh, but then the Schmidt decomposition tells us there should be this inner product preserving map that takes us from A to SB. And if we act by W on rho, uh, Actually, let me just give myself a bit more space here. So we, we do the identity on R A bar tensored with W that will take A to SB. And we act on rho. What we'll get out is our phi. OK. So we're just applying the Schmidt decomposition here. And this may not look uh, like we've done anything. But let's go back to our picture now. So we've said that there's this W uh, that turns rho into um, you know, this new purification. So this is going to be W. 
this block that I wrote down. And if we apply W, then we get phi up here and we get psi down here, right? That was what the Schmidt decomposition told us. But look what we've done, right? Um, by acting with W on the A system, we recovered the entanglement with the reference. That's exactly what happened here, right? And that was the question we were trying to ask. We we're trying to ask, you know, we we're trying to answer the question: Is the entanglement with the reference present in the system A? And what we found is, provided there are no correlations between the reference and the complement of A, then yes, the entanglement um, with the reference is present in A. And so the analogy that I'd like to give to this, or you know, I, I actually find this quite ama you know, quite amazing. Like, if the entanglement um, between the reference, or if the entanglement with the reference could be recovered from A, then you would expect the state with the complement of A to, to factorize, right? That you know, all of the entanglement should be in A. Um, but now we're finding it's a converse, right? That um, provided there's no correlation with the reference in A bar, then we can recover the information from A. Yeah, and I said the, the analogy that I like is, you know, suppose that you're, you know, you're driving your car, and all of a sudden you find that there's some acrid smoke filling the cabin. You say, oh, this is bad. And you, you, know, you, you get your car to, the, to a mechanic. And the mechanic looks around, um, it peeks inside the car a little bit and says, ooh, yeah, acrid smoke, that's terrible. And so the mechanic just rolls down the windows on your car and the acrid smoke uh, you know, leaves the cabin and then just says, okay, great, problem fixed, right? You know, you're, you're, your, your reaction would probably be not to pay this mechanic. Um, but in this case, um, this is essentially what you do. You look for the this, you, know, you look for the symptom, you know, the, the smoke um, being you know, some indication that something is wrong, which is would be correlation of the reference uh, in A bar. That's some indication that the you know, there's correlation between you know, that, that that is leaked out of A. And provided you see there's no you know there's no smoke, there's no correlation between the reference and A bar. Uh, then the problem is fixed, right? There's you know, the, the, the entanglement has to be an A already. Um, so this is the this is the argument. Um, maybe I'll just write down a couple more things here. There's a question from- Oh yeah, go yeah. ahead. Oh yeah, so I guess um, like in practice, like you don't know how to actually find W, right? Like if you actually want to perform the recovery operation. So do you have any intuition for like, when it is easy to find W and when it isn't, and like I guess what. Oh, that says about uh, so I haven't told you how to find W, but there, yeah, there, there's you know there are things that you can do for sure. Um, so I'll come back to that in one second because I just want to say a, a, a little bit more. I mean, uh, like you can extract W from the singular value decomposition, right? At least in, in principle, right? It's there. Um, it is one of the matrices in the singular value composition. And the, yeah, the, the proof, there, there are algorithmic proofs of the singular value decomposition that will tell you how to find W, but I, I can say more about it than, than that in just a second. Um, so I'll just say, you know, I'll just write it down so it's in the notes. So W decodes the entanglement with the reference from A. And this is, you know, this is quantum error correction. You know, we have, uh, we have recovered, you know, we have corrected for the loss of A bar. And so a necessary and sufficient condition to be able to perform quantum error correction is that when you look at the density operator of your reference and the, and the part of the system that's been deleted, been lost, that it should factorize. And this works perfectly well in the approximate setting as well. So if the fidelity between the reference and A bar and the product state is at least one minus epsilon, um, if you recall the definition of the fidelity involved looking at purifications and optimizing over purifications. And so you can run this, you know, this argument not using the Schmidt decomposition, but just the, the definition of the fidelity and you'll find that you'll be able to recover the state with fidelity at least one minus epsilon. Um, so coming back to the question, how would you find this map? Um, 
in the case, so another approximate version of this statement that you could make would be that the mutual information um, is high. And that's going to be a special case of some monotonicity of relative entropy. And there's the, I think I gave you the reference to approximate, um, the approximate, um, well, we made the statement that for monotonicity of relative entropy, um, if the monotonicity is saturated, then you know there's a recovery map. If the monotonicity is approximately saturated, there's an approximate recovery map. And the, the map is explicit. You know? and, and so you can apply that in this situation to get an approximate recovery. And so when I mentioned that we had applied this uh, and I gave a reference in the case of entanglement wedge reconstruction, um, you can go and look in the paper and you get, you know, you'll see that there are precise, you know, there are actual formulas for how you would, uh, for what W would look like. It's not, we, we, I guess we don't write down exactly W because we're only interested in the channel from A to S. So we trace over the B system. Um, so we write down that channel, but it's, it's what you care about, I assume, yeah. Are there other questions? Again, this is a, this is a pretty, I find like this is, you know, there's, this is a pretty subtle argument. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's not hard, um, but you're kind of pulling a rabbit out of a hat, uh, right? That you're getting some very strong conclusion from what look like, you know, you know weak statements uh, are without ever having to do anything very difficult. And so um, I, I encourage you, if, you, if you're going to, I encourage you to take a little bit of time to mull this over. Because this is uh, this is the reason, yeah, you know, or at least one of the reasons that quantum error correction just appears naturally, as I said, in many body systems and holography and elsewhere. Other questions? Maybe I can ask a question here. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. And I'm not sure it's particularly relevant to this discussion in particular, but it seems like. A whole um, reconstruction of information about the regional system only accessing part of, uh, part of the system, uh, the region A and N, relies on the factorization of the Hilbert space. And oh, yes. Yeah. But if that's the case, uh, how can these be applied, for example, to gravity or breath information paradox if we know that in gravity, I mean, at least it's not really clear if the Hilbert space actually factorizes and probably doesn't? Yeah. Uh, OK, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, it might be one to have in the discussion section, but the part of the answer to that story is that all of the, yeah, everything that I've been talking about here can be expressed in dual language, where you speak about algebras of observables, and, um, and you speak about restrictions of algebras uh, and um, and commutensive algebras, like instead of tensor products. And so that language might be um, better, like more appropriate um, in the, you know, certainly in quantum field theory, but even in a, in a quantum gravity setting. And in fact, it's, it's necessary to go to the algebraic language um, to really capture, if not the intuition, but, or at least, you know, some of the important phenomena uh, that occur there. Um, If the notion of a subsystem completely breaks down, right? So, like, well, then it's not even clear what you would mean by the question. I would say, right? So, I I, I think this kind of reasoning um, should be applicable, provided the question makes sense. Uh, but if the question doesn't make sense, then yeah, certainly the answer doesn't make sense. Um, okay. So, the last thing I wanted to do, I'm going to come back to the to the shore code and place it in a more general context. And this is the context, uh, it's gonna be the fam, most of the codes that people work with uh, you know, in quantum computation are in this family that we call stabilizer codes. And it gives you lots of interesting examples. And in the, in the context of holography, it gives you some, uh, a lot of nice toy models that you can work with. And you'll, you'll see some of them uh, again over the course of the month. And so I just wanna introduce you to this picture. Um, and so the starting point, we're gonna have this Pauli group on n qubits, which is just the group that you get when you allow yourself to act by Pauli operators on each of the individual qubits, um, and then you multiply everything out. So this is going to be the group generated 
by xj and say zk, one is less than or equal to j and k is less than or equal to n. So it's it's the it's basically the Pauli operators and the phases one one minus one i and minus i. And we're going to think about subgroups of this Pauli group. Um, oh, whoops, sorry. Well, we are going to think about subgroups of the Pauli group, um, in, in particular commuting subgroups. And our codes are going to be the common plus one eigenspace of all the elements of the of these subgroups. And so I'll, I'll use script C to de denote the code. And another way of writing this is going to be that the code is going to consist of all vectors in on the n qubits, such that when I act by an element in this group, it doesn't affect the state. So for all m in S. And again, S is some commutative subgroup of the Pauli group. Uh, and this, you know, you can see why these are called stabilizer codes, because the codes are defined by the condition that they're stabilized by the elements of the group. Um, we didn't use this language uh, at the time, but you know, the short code is an example. So I've written down here the, um, the eight observables that, um, that we use to uh, perform error correction in the short code. And if you are in the code, then all of the, when you measure these observables, you always got the, the expectation, or you, you always got outcome one, right? The, the eigenvalues are plus one and minus one. And when you, you know, the, the code words were all eigenvectors of eigenvalue one. And so that's, you know, this is a commutative group. And so that's also going to be true if you multiply out these, uh, you multiply out these, uh, these generators. And so there's a group here um, generated by these eight, uh, these eight observables. And let's call G the number of generators. So the number of qubits is nine. The number of generators is eight. And the dimension of the code, um, you know, this is something that you can prove, is going to be two to the n minus G. So I'll highlight that. Now, of course, it's important that you, you, know, you have to take independent generators. Uh, for that to be the right formula. But in this case, that tells us that the dimension of the code is two to the nine minus eight, which is two. So there's a single qubit encoded. Um, and we know, you know we, we wrote down what that qubit was explicitly in terms of uh, two vectors spanning the, uh, the code space. Um, now you might ask yourself- Is there a standard reference? For, oh, for this? Is there a for for yeah, this type of these basic facts about stabilizer codes. Um, yeah, so again, it, it's all in the Preskill notes. Um, sure. The in some ways, the, the standard reference Dan Gottesman's PhD thesis is where he defines stabilizer codes, and a lot of people just read that thesis. But uh, you might be better off going to you know a slightly more digested version like like Preskill's notes. Um, Great, thanks. Yeah. Okay. So the short code was the, kind of the dumbest thing that we could, or that was the first thing that we wrote down, right? We said, okay, I'm going to put on the, I'm going to put on the the rain the raincoat and the down jacket, and that's how I'm going to stay warm and dry at the same time. Um, but doing you know, the first thing that comes to mind is probably not the most efficient thing. And so there's another code, the Steen seven qubit code. So seven qubits, that's you know n equals seven, and I've written down the generators of the stabilizer uh, group here. And you know, there's structure to them, but we don't need to, to get into it. Um, or or you know, some structure that you can see the X, you know, the stabilizer generators break into two subsets, um, the X stabilizers and the Z stabilizers. Um, there are three of each. So we have G equals six. And of course that tells us the dimension of the code once again, Two to the seven minus six is two, um, and so this is a code that it still manages to correct an arbitrary error on a single qubit in an unknown location. So it's in that sense, it's as good as the short code, but it uses fewer qubits. Um, and you might ask, is this the best that you can do? And the answer is no. So there's also a five qubit code. Um, so n equals five, g equals four. The dimension of the code five 
two to the five minus four is two. Um, and here you can see, um, how does this differ from the short code and the Steen code? Well, now the stabilizers mix Xs and Zs. And there is some structure, if you look at it, that the cyclic permute, you know, you, if you start off with the first stabilizer and then cyclically permute it, you get the other ones. Um, and you might ask, you know, um, there should be five permutations. Why didn't I include the fifth one? And the reason is that the fifth one is not independent of the first four. Um, so all of these codes uh, correct one error on a single qubit. Now, how do we know that? Um, well, we, we have to do a little bit of thinking. I'll just introduce some notation. The weight of an operator is uh, in this Pauli group is going to be the number of sites that are not the identity. So in this example, the weight is five. So this is the number of slots not equal to the identity. And the distance of the code, this is a, an important parameter, is the lowest weight Pauli operator that will take all code words uh, back into the code. Oh, someone had uh, a comment. That's another reference. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gottesman was writing a book. I don't know if he ever finished it. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks for sharing that. Okay, so the distance of the code is the lowest weight Pauli operator. Uh, so let's call it E. Oops. And it's not in the stabilizer because the elements of the stabilizer are supposed to take you, you know, from the code to, it, uh, to itself. By definition, they define the code. Um, but it's the lowest weight Pauli operator that isn't a stabilizer that still takes you back into the code. So phi, an error acting on phi um, is still in the code for all phi in the code, all right? So this is an operator that can actually do something non-trivial um, to a code word. And mathematically, you can express this as saying that this operator E commutes with all elements of the stabilizer. And why is that the same thing? Well, if E commutes with an element of the stabilizer, then it doesn't change the eigenvalue of that stabilizer. And so um, this tells you that uh, E acting on a code word will still have eigenvalue plus one for all stabilizer generators um, or all, all elements of the stabilizer group. So this is the notion of distance. Um, and we can go back, for example, to the Steen code and ask, you know, what is the distance? So what do we have to do? We have to find an operator which is not in the stabilizer, but nonetheless commutes with all the stabilizer generators. So let's go back to our Steen code here. Here it is. And I'll propose one for you. Um, X, 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 I, 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 right? So this clearly commutes with everything on the first line because X is always commute with each other. It commutes with the, the first stabilizer on the second line because the Xs act uh, on a different set of qubits than the Zs. It commutes with the second stabilizer uh, because we have two, X, two Xs overlapping with two Zs. Each of them anti-commutes, so minus one squared is one, so they commute. Um, and the same reasoning applies here. Uh, two Xs commute with two Zs. And so we've identified an element of weight three um, that commutes with all the stabilizer generators. And what that tells us is that the distance, well, I'll say is equal, but it's really, it tells us that it's less than or equal to three, right? Like we found, a, we know that the distance can't be any more than three because we found an, you know, we found an operator that, uh, that commutes with all the stabilizer generators and has weight three, but I'll claim now, that is the lowest weight such operator. You know, if you, you'll never be able to find one of weight two. And so the, the distance really is three. And if we have a, a code with a known distance, and let's say that the distance is two R plus one, then it can correct R single qubit errors and it could, uh, at unknown arbitrary locations, and it can correct two R errors at known locations. And if you want to understand why that is, you know, think back to the repetition code um, for bits that we, we saw early on. Um, 
So say the repetition code on, on three bits, um, the, the distance of that code is three. Because you, if you have the 000 code word, you have to flip three bits to, you know, to send that code word back into the code. So the distance is three. Um, but if you want to be able to correct a bit flip, um, you have to be able to perform a majority vote. So you're able to correct just one, right? So here R would be one. Um, on the other hand, if you wanted to correct for erasure, you can correct for twice as many. You can, you can correct for two out of the three bits getting lost. And so quant classical error correcting codes and quantum error correcting codes work you know, in a similar way here. So that's just the language. I think you'll, you'll, hear, you'll hear more about it later on in the course. But what I will, I think I have time to end with a very interesting example of a stabilizer code. Um, before I do, I do that, though, I'll, I'll pause just to ask, you know, to see if there are questions. Okay, well, if not, let's talk about Kataev's Toric code, um, which he wrote back, back, wrote down back in 1997, I think. Um, and just some visual notation. Uh, um, this is going to be a situation where we're going to have a qubit on each edge of a graph, right? So um, in the case of the torque, uh, the shore code, which you, you've seen before, here I have a, in, I have a, I've written a line and I have nine edges. And each edge would correspond to a qubit in the shore code. And so one element of the stabilizer might be Z1, Z2, right? So I would, I would depict it like that visually. And an, an el another element would be x4, x5, x6, x7, x8, x9, right? So this is how the, I would depict the stabilizers of the short code in this you know, graphical notation. So for the toric code, we're again going to have qubits on each edge, uh, in, this, uh, you know, in this case of a square lattice. And it's going to be an L by L lattice. So let's say L by L, oops. L by L. And so we have uh, let's see. And what I will do, I'm going to use periodic boundary conditions here. And so what we really, you know, this is why it's called the torus code. You know, topologically, what we have here is a torus. Um, so I have L squared qubits on the vertical edges. And I have L squared qubits on the horizontal edges. So I have a total of two L squared qubits. Right, so our, our N, the total number of qubits in the situation is, uh, is two L squared. And I have to define a code for you. So I'm going to start um, defining some operators that are going to be our stabilizer generators. So the first one, I go to, I go to a square. Oops. Um, so this is going to be a, a plaquette that I'll label, I'll give it a, a label P. And I act with Zs around the edges of P. So this is going to be an operator um, that I'll call S sub P. So this is an operator. Remember, this is really just a, a bunch of qubits. And so this is a, a, an operator that acts as the identity everywhere except for the four qubits that I've labeled. And on those one, it acts as Z. OK, so Z, 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 Z. And then for each vertex in the graph, so I'll label the vertex here V. Then on the edges adjoining that vertex, I could act by X operators. And like so, so four, the four X operators on the edges adjoining that vertex. And I'll call those things my S sub Vs. And I can write down all such vertex operators and all such plaquette operators. So SPSV, so V vertices and P plaquettes. And my stabilizer group is going to be the group that's generated by all of these operators, where I allow the you know, all the vertex operators and all the plaquette operators. Okay, so 
this you know this defines a code. Um, we don't know the properties of the code yet, but yeah, it's a code. It has a bunch of it has a bunch of stabilizer generators, and it has some very interesting structure. So let's think about um, what happens when we start multiplying up these stabilizer generators. So I'm going to multiply up. Oops. Say this one, this one, this one, and this one, right? So remember, each one of those squares represents Zs acting on all the edges around the square. Um, and remember, you know, the fact about the Pauli operators, Z squared is the identity. So on the on the inner edges, I'm going to have two Zs, and the Zs cancel there, right? And so this product, what it actually amounts to is Zs around the outside, right? So I'll have Z, 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 and Z. Um, and what you can see from this is that the elements of the stabilizer, the, the, of the stabilizer group, are actually going to be topologically trivial loops uh, on the torus. Right? You, can, you can make these topologi topologically trivial loops by just multiplying. You, know, you start off with a single stabilizer generator. It's, it's topologically trivial, and you keep multiplying them out. Uh, and you'll remain topologically trivial. So the elements of the stabilizer group are the topologically trivial loops. And that's the, the case for the Z stabilizers. You know, technically, if we talk about the, the X stabilizers, we should be talking about loops in the in the in the dual in the dual lattice. Um, but it's you know, it doesn't it doesn't matter very much. OK, so that's nice. So there, this setup, you know, there's some interesting connection between topology and the structure of the code, or at least the structure of the, of the stabilizer group. Let's, start, let's try to figure out how many qubits are actually encoded in this code. So how many, how many plaquette generators do I have? I'll ask you. Anyone want to volunteer? How many squares are there in this lattice? L squared. L squared, exactly. And how many vertex operators? Also L squared? Also L squared. Um, you know, the vertex operators are just shifted, you know, a half unit to the left and a half unit to uh, up, say, from from the from the corresponding plaquette. And so there are a total of two L squared uh, generators uh, of this type. But that actually starts to that doesn't look so good for us because we started with two L squared qubits. We have two L squared generators, and remember the dimension of the code was two to the uh, number of qubits minus number of generators. Um, so that'd be two to the zero. So a one-dimensional code is not interesting code. There's no room for any information, right? There's just one state in there. Um, but my claim is that these are not all independent generators. What happens if I multiply together all the plaquette generators? So product over all P of SP. What do I get? The identity. Exactly, right? Because uh, every edge is going to appear in two plaquette operators. So on every edge, we're going to get a Z squared. And all those Z squareds, uh, well, they're, they're all equal to the identity. So we get the identity. And the same thing happens for the vertices. And so we don't have two L squared independent generators. We have two L squared minus two. And so the number of encoded qubits is the total number of qubits minus the number of independent generators, which is two. And so this is a code that has a four-dimensional, uh, a, a four it's a four-dimensional uh, code, right? Uh, you can put two qubits inside. And there's more to say about that. Um, a lot more to say, but let's just say a little bit more. Let's try to think about the distance. So remember the distance of the code 
is the lowest weight non-stabilizer operator that preserves the code subspace. And sometimes these are called logical operators because they're logical operators because they act on the code and they do something non-trivial to the code. Um, and we haven't argued this totally rig rigorously, um, but the lowest weight non-stabilizer operator, how are you going to make it? You're going to make it by having a topologically non-trivial loop uh, on the torus. So for example, you could have Zs wrapping around like this. So I'll say this is supposed to be a logical operator. Uh, don't know where to say it. Logical operator. So what will the weight of the logical operator be? The weight of this lowest weight non-stabilizer operator. I mean, it's just the linear size of the torus, right? So it's L. And again, you can argue there aren't going to be any, uh, there aren't, there, there won't be any poly, poly operators of lower weight um, that preserve the code space and aren't stabilizer operators. And so the distance of this code is L. So this is actually a code that has a pretty high distance, right? It can correct for, uh, it can correct for a lot of errors. It's not just like the, the short code that we saw at the beginning that can correct for a single error. This code can correct for uh, order L errors um, occurring anywhere on the uh, anywhere on the lattice. And the fact that this uh, this code is organized in this geometrical fashion with these stabilizer generators that are that are local and low weight suggests that you could think about, for example, writing down a Hamiltonian. You could say, well. What if I wrote down a Hamiltonian that was the sum over vertices of SV, uh, sum over plaquettes of SP, with a minus sign so that the code is actually the ground space of the Hamiltonian, right? It's not such a stretch to imagine that at least in some kind of synthetic system, you could realize uh, this Hamiltonian, um, or that you could realize a Hamiltonian in the same phase as this one, for example. Um, and if you did, then somehow you would have quantum information being robustly stored, not through some active quantum error correction, but just through um, the physics of the system. As long as you, you know, if you, if you cooled the, the whole system down, um, then the, uh, you would have some suppression based on uh, you know, the Boltzmann fact factor uh, for the occupation probability of the ground state versus the excited states. Now, what do you get? You know, as a, you know, how does the error correction? How do the error correction properties of the code translate into some robustness um, for this ground space? Um, the translation is that you could imagine, or well, in reality, you, you, even if you tried to make this Hamiltonian, you're not going to succeed. You're going to make maybe that Hamiltonian plus some perturbation. And if you assume that the perturbations are local, yeah, and uh, parameter you know, have some strength lambda, then the fact that the distance of the code is L manifests itself by saying that the splitting in the degeneracy, you know, so that uh, in the in the degeneracy being the, um, the the degeneracy of the ground space will only occur at order L in perturbation theory, right? And so that this uh, this protected space uh, in which all of the states um, undergo the same trivial evolution um, will remain protected um, and the, the states won't require uh, in the ground space won't acquire relative phases. So that's uh, that's the Torah code you know there's there's obviously a lot more to say about all of this the connection between quantum error correction and um, and topological order in general, the uh, the connection between many body physics and quantum error correction, we haven't talked about many body, or I should say a mixed state entanglement or many uh, multi-particle entanglement at all. Uh, there's an awful lot that we, we could have discussed. We didn't have time to discuss quantum complexity uh, and, uh, and computation at all in, the, in these five lectures, but hopefully I've exposed you to enough that um, you have some sense of the lay of the land and you will be able to understand 
the topics that come up when uh, when these ideas are being applied in the rest of the course to uh, situations in quantum field theory and holography. And I think we're right on time. And so I'll thank you for your attention. I'll thank you for your questions. You had great questions. And I'll stop here. Thanks, Patrick. Um, so maybe we can have a few questions. I think Alec had a raised hand. Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I have a question about the toric code. So um, can we create like not like topologically non-trivial loops, but maybe two of them by considering a row of these um, like placket you know, operators? Then that would give us two loops that go across the torus, right? Um, yes, you would. Um, in that in that case, it so happens. I have to think about this, but it, uh, that that it acts trivially on the code. Um, I see because Z squares the identity. Um, so. It's Sorry. actually yeah. Um, so when you when you have your your two encoded qubits, it you know it's useful to then think you know if you're actually going to use this for for quantum computation at least, um, it's useful to to say okay well how do I implement you know operations on my encoded states, um, and first you have to decide what your encoded states are going to be, uh, and one way to do that is just but you know, to define what, you know, some algebra of Pauli operators acting on the encoded system. And this one, you know, the one that I wrote down here um, is a natural way to write down the encoded Z operator for one of your qubits. And then the encoded X operator for the same qubit would be, um, maybe I'll use a different color, red. Yeah. So if you put X's on all of these, that would be the encoded X. And you can see these will have the right commutation relations because the, the vertical X's will overlap with the horizontal Z's at one location. So their, their commutation relation will, uh, it, will be a prop, it will be a representation of the, of the representation or the commutation relations of the Pauli operators. Um, so if this is an encoded Z though, um, if, you, if you have two of them, um, you know, Z squares the identity and they cancel. And so it actually is a trivial operation in the group. Um, but I have to think a little bit because they're, they're analogs of these things that you have in higher dimensions. Um, and um, But somehow it, it will work out that it'll be topologically trivial. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I think this, this actually also answers the, the another question. Well, maybe top, well, I should say, Topologically trivial is going to be, maybe the better term is homologically trivial. Mm. Yeah, so you have to be in what sense are you are you topologically trivial? Yeah. So this is with the Z two homology, um, and so yeah. yeah. Thank you. So so I think this also answers another question. Uh, I was going to ask that if you like maybe combine two of these logical operators, then you'll get you'll get. Um, you know, like two loops like that. And if that's an element, a non-trivial element of the stabilizer, then um, then like we cannot distinguish between between those two. But but you're you're saying that, that we get identity if we if we combine two of these logical yeah. operators. So. Yeah, you and, and you get exactly what you want to get. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Jonathan, I think is next. Yeah, I, I had two different questions. Um, mm -hmm. So the first was uh, for the stabilizer codes, I can imagine defining two measures of efficiency of the code. So mm -hmm. for example, like the distance over the number of qubits I used and also the a number of encoded qubits per like total number of qubits I used. So I was wondering if it is known what like over all possible codes, like what the most optimal rate is, like how good can a code be? Yeah, okay, good question. Um, so an awful lot is known about this. Um, and I have, you know, at one point I knew quite a bit about these things and I, <laughs> you know, I've, I've drifted away from it a, uh, a little bit. Um, so 
let's see. Yeah, like the, you, you can look up the statements, like the things like something like the, the, the quantum singleton bound, like there, there are a number of bounds on that relate the, um, the distance, the number of encoded qubits, um, and the and the total number of physical qubits in the code. Um, so not just the quantum singleton bound, but there, there are others. And so, um, and people have worked very hard yeah, to, to find families of codes that saturate various bounds. Um, and I, you know, I, I could, I can dig up a, a reference, you know, a, a current sure. reference and I'll post it in the, uh, in Slack. Yeah, um, that'd be great. Yeah. The, so presumably if I want to increase the number of errors I can correct, there's some trade-off between like the number of qubits I can encode. Like you shouldn't be able to make both of those like as good as possible. Uh, yeah, no, exactly. Like there, there are definitely trade-offs, right? Uh, sure. More encoded qubits means smaller distance. And what there's been quite a bit of work recently. Um, another parameter which is relevant is the, the largest weight uh, of a stabilizer generator. Like if we look at this toric code, one thing that's nice about it is that the stabilizer generators all have constant weight, even as the code gets bigger. And so what typically happens if you want to if you want to make codes that have the best parameters, then the stabilizer generators have to become big as the code becomes big. And what that means in practice, if you're doing active quantum error correction, is that you have you have complicated measurements to perform uh, in order to actually you know, determine you know, uh, the syndrome, and um, and that may not be desirable. Uh, if you wanted to try to implement it with a Hamiltonian. Right, it means that you have many, many you, know, you have terms in the Hamiltonian where the number of term you know, or uh, that act on a number of sites, which is increasing as the size of the system grows, which is not very physical. Um, and again, if you're going to do the Hamiltonian version, you might also want to impose locality constraints. And so people have studied uh, these trade-offs in in, the, in those settings as well. So it's you know, the relationship between number of encoded qubits and distance under the constraint of locality um, um, was studied by uh, Poulain, Bravi, and Terhal. Um, and so they, they have, they have a, a, a nice characterization uh, of that. Um, and recently people have been extending those kinds of, you know, those kinds of questions to the non-local setting, but, but where you still have low weight stabilizers. And that's what's called a, a low density parity check code. Um, so if you heard if you heard of LDPC, you know that those uh, that um, floating around ever before. So these would be quantum LDPC codes, and those are you know, for practical reasons, you know, kind of the ones that you're likely to want to use. Um, and the and so there's a lot of work right now on finding the best LDPC C codes and understanding the trade-offs. Um, Cool. Yeah. Uh, and then my, a few references. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, mm -hmm. And then my second question was, um, so for the toric code, you were using a square torus. So presumably mm -hmm. there might be like interesting generalizations to like other Riemannian surfaces. And you could think of like arbitrary uh, genus and like different sizes of the different uh, cycles. Yep. So I was just wondering if there's like anything interesting there or if there's any like cool connections between like the properties of the codes and then like the geometry of the space the code is on. Um, yeah, so uh, the degeneracy of the ground space, you know, it, it scales with the genus of the, of the system, as, as you can kind of imagine, right? Because um, really, if you, in order, you know, an encoded qubit, you know, I, I drew an encoded qubit here, and what you needed was a pair of cycles in the homology that were, um, that were intersecting. Um, and if you have a higher genus surface, you're going to have more uh, you know, homologically distinct cycles, and each one of them is good. You know, th those are going to give you more logical operators and a higher degeneracy in the ground space. So that that was actually understood back in Kataya's you know, first paper. Um, and let's see. Um, I mean, the, the the basic story is that the answer to your question is yes, right? That the that the the topology of, of the space you know, the, there's a very close connection between the topology of the space uh, and its properties and the, and the underlying code degeneracy. Um, the the distance of the code, 
you know, relies on the on the physical size of uh, of these cycles. And so it's not purely topological, you know, it isn't a topological quantity. I mean, it really depends on the on the underlying geometry. Um, so does that mean then there's like different measures of distance depending on like which cycle you're looking at? Yeah, I mean, if you had a small cycle, yeah, if you had small cycles and big cycles, then the distance mm -hmm. would be you know, would be determined by the small cycles. Um, and 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 people make use of this. You could also, instead of thinking about the torus, you could just think, you know, a more practical version of this. And people actually are, you know, like Google and, and friends, you know, they actually want to implement the toric code. That's how they're thinking of doing quantum computing. They're not going to do it on a torus. What they're going to do is they're going to have a planar arrangement of qubits and they're going to puncture it uh, in different places. And so by puncturing uh, the plane, you know, they introduce some, you know, some topology. And that's where they're going to get their, you know, their non-trivial cycles from. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Annie? Um, so I guess this is maybe similar to a question that came up earlier. But uh, so in these quantum computing applications, like when I choose my stabilizers, like I'm interested in like maybe optimizing the number of qubits or the distance of the code. Um, so in the holographic case, like I might care about things like locality or like geometric things, but yeah, like how do I go about choosing my stabilizers and what do I consider a good code, I guess? <laughs> okay, so in, in the holographic setting, um, well, actual, yeah, the actual holographic setting, so ADS CFT, um, the error correct, you know, you can analyze the error correction properties of ADS CFT by studying the behavior of entropy, right? That you, you ask the question, you know, because we, we, you know, we, we, we saw that you could use the mutual information to diagnose whether a state factorizes. And so you could, you know, you can, you can use that to, to figure out, you know, under what circumstances can I perform some error correction in ADS CFT more or less, right? Um, and after going through some, you know, doing some work, which you'll, you'll hear about later on uh, in the course, um, what you find is that roughly speaking, you know, or the, so the way you calculate the entropy in ADS CFT is with this Ryutaki Nagi formula, right? So the area of some uh, extremal surface and the constraints, you know, the, the surfaces that you optimize over, they have to be, homological to the boundary region whose entropy you're calculating. Um, and so what does it mean you know, for, for, two, uh, for two surfaces to be homologically related? It means that they are the common boundary of something else. And that something else is the entanglement wedge. Um, and so the, the version of error correction that appears in ADS-CFT is that um, any operator in the, entangle, you know, in the entanglement wedge of some boundary region uh, you know, any bulk operator can be implemented in, in terms of the boundary in term, you know, only in the corresponding boundary region. That was that was said not said very well, so I apologize. Um, but the the bottom line is, you know, the, the, there is a type of error correction that that occurs and that we understand quite well in ADS CFT. And so, if you're trying to construct toy models. Um, what you want the toy models to do is to reproduce the properties of ADS-CFT. Um, and so one property you would like them, you know, like them to have, and like the first toy model um, was this happy code uh, by um, Harlow, Preskill, Hostowski, uh, Yoshida. Um, and I might've missed somebody. Um, and what they were trying to do with that code was come up with a nice simple toy model, yeah, where you had qubits that were, um, there was some, some notion of a bulk, and that was the, the logical, uh, the logical space was the bulk, the physical space was the boundary, and you could correct, you know, it had error correction properties similar to ADS-CFT, so it had this entanglement wedge property. And their code came very close to achieving that. You know, it didn't quite achieve it, but you know, it, it, it came pretty close. And so subsequent toy models, um, do a better job than that. And then others have, have then tried to introduce further you know, additional properties of ADS-CFT, right? Because like the, the purpose of the toy models is often to ask the question, I mean, you can have different purposes, right? But one purpose is just to try to understand, okay, ADS-CFT is this kind of very tightly, uh, 
tightly coordinated machine where everything works together, right? But if you want to understand how the different pieces work uh, independently of the rest, um, then it's nice to pull out, you know, to you know, to construct some solvable toy model where you could just have the effect that you're interested in and, and then and play around with it and see how, how it works without having to worry about all the other complication. And so, yeah, that's what people have been doing with, with these toy models is just trying to say, okay, well, if we want to understand the error correction without all of the fancy other stuff of ADS CFT, can we just write down some nice, simple, uh, uh, some nice, simple model that has similar properties? Um, and I'd say that's the that's the, the real use of the toy models. I mean, some people, to some degree, have some you know, some faith that they may they may have some fidelity to what's really happening. You know, like maybe maybe you know, like people thinking about tensor networks at least at some point thought you know maybe you can construct a theory based on tensor networks. Uh, I don't have a, a lot of faith in that direction myself. Like I think it may that might be barking up the wrong tree. Um, but I guess that's my perspective. Does that answer the question? I kind of rambled on a bit there. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Okay. Um, Jacob? I think William was before me. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I missed William. William. Yeah, no problem. Um, so when you, going back to this uh, notion of distance, uh, mm -hmm. when you were first talking about it, it seemed to me, and now I'm starting to second guess my, my thoughts here, um, but it seemed to me almost like a, a central charge for the, uh, for the stabilizer group, at least for stabilizer states that are left invariant under these um, under these specific operations, is there any is there any sense in thinking about it that way? <clears throat> um, I am not sure. I mean, that's a, that's an interesting idea. But so you think it's it's like a central charge. Um, Oh, is it because of this commutation condition and the way that it's Correct. Is the way that's defined? Well, for that reason, and then also for the fact that these um, the, the 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 group S is a is a symmetry group of all stabilizer states mm -hmm. um, by definition, right? So, uh, at least for for that subset uh, of quantum states, you'd think that perhaps it could be thought of that way. Um, so I've never heard that proposal before. So I, I don't have a an immediate response as to whether um, the analogy is a good one or not, but it, it sounds like a, it sounds like an idea worth worth pursuing a little bit. Um, like the it seems that I'm not sure that the the parameter itself, which is measuring this weight, uh, mm -hmm. like the number of sites that acting. Uh, it, is really the the same kind of thing that's being measured by by central charge, um, but it may still be getting at some related concept. I, I'm afraid I, I don't have very much to say about that right now, except that it's a you know it's an interesting analogy. And I let's see, like maybe if you wanted to pursue it, um, well, the error correction property, you know, like um, a lot of CFTs do have this error correction property. Um, there's a nice paper by Isaac Kim and a collaborator on error correction. Well, so, so there's holographic error correction. There's a whole literature on that. There's um, a type of tensor network, which is, which which is nice for representing um, states in CFTs called the multi-scale entanglement renormalization ansatz, MIRA. And Isaac Kim wrote a paper in which he showed that um, quantum states that were constructed using Mira naturally had some error correction properties. Um, and, and so that might give some, you know, some way of making a, a bit of a bridge, right? That you, you uh, between the stabilizer formalism and, and, and CFTs, like that you might be able to work with, uh, with some Mira construction um, that, you know, that generated stabilizer codes and then asked, you know, what is the what, you know, what is the proper analog there of the of the central charge? And if it turned out to be um, the same thing or related, that, I think that'd be a very nice observation. Thank you. Okay, Jacob, uh, last question. Um, I was just wondering whether you know if anyone has studied um, this type of simple models and 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 ways of 
thinking about codes in context where your system has some gauge redundancy. Um, of course, if you if you gauge fix and work in terms of gauge fix variables, there's nothing interesting to say. But if I was wondering if there's any any work in that direction. Um, I'm not that familiar with it, but yes, there is work. And actually, one of my students working with a postdoc is about to put out a paper on gauging the happy code. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I have to profess my ignorance that I, I haven't uh, read that literature very much. But uh, if, if you do a search, you'll, you'll, find, you'll find some work, I think, for these topological codes um, where, where people have thought about it. And for the holographic codes, I, th I think they'll be done in a month or two. And, and so they'll put something up. Um, yeah. Great, thanks. OK, um, well, let, let's finish there. Um, and thank Patrick uh, for a nice series of lectures. Thank you very much. It's, if you want to unmute. <laughs>